We are starting a new unit today called Simple Harmonic Motion and Waves. There is a connection between those two topics. You're going to see in another week what that connection is. But for now, for the next week, we're going to focus on that first part of it, Simple Harmonic Motion. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of Simple Harmonic Motion, and then I'm going to ask you to describe what Simple Harmonic Motion is based on the properties of those examples. If I take a pendulum, a pendulum is something that swings back and forth. Like a, like a swing set, or like a set of keys, like this. That's an example of simple harmonic motion. Another example of simple harmonic motion would be if I pull a spring, stretch it out, or compress it for that matter, and then let it go, and it starts vibrating, that would be an example of simple harmonic motion. Who could tell me what simple harmonic motion is based on properties of those two examples? Take a look at this. Compare this motion of the pendulum going back and forth with this motion of when I stretch that spring and then I just I hold on to one end and just let it go vibrating back and forth. Motion yeah, it's motion that repeats itself, repetitive motion. Now, that's not technically the definition of simple harmonic motion. That's kind of how we usually recognize simple harmonic motion. The real definition is, is not on the surface going to make quite as much sense as motion that repeats itself. That's why I listed it this way first, is so that you understand what I'm talking about before I give you the real definition. Okay, I'll explain the definition though, so in a few minutes it will make sense hopefully to you. It is motion that repeats itself, but it repeats itself because of the real definition of simple harmonic motion, which is motion in which the restoring force, that's a force that pulls it back to where it started, is proportional to or related to its displacement. So in other words, as, as I pull an elastic back or a spring back, the further I pull it away from its normal or equilibrium position, the more I pull it, the bigger the force becomes. You guys recognize that, right? Hey, if you've ever pulled an elastic a little bit, you know it's easy, right? You pull it a little bit more, it becomes harder. You pull it a little bit more, it requires even more force. The force that's pulling that elastic or spring back to where it started, the restoring force, is bigger as the displacement, which is the distance away from where it started, gets bigger. So the restoring force is proportional to the displacement. Now, be careful with that. When we talk about this displacement, we're not talking about the displacement of, you know, how far does the spring fly across the room when I let it go. We're talking about the displacement, how much it's stretched or squished away from its natural or equilibrium position. Motion which the restoring force is proportional to the displacement. Okay, we'll give you a little bit more explanation of that uh, when we give you an equation in just a few minutes. But in the time being, we'll write down a couple examples. We'll use the, the uh, pendulum, because the pendulum goes back and forth, motion that repeats itself. The force, this, when I, look, look up here, everybody. When I have this pendulum straight down here, this is the natural or the equilibrium position. If I pull it back like this, there's a force that's pulling it back to its natural or equilibrium position. But as I pull it back even more, that force pulling it back to its natural or equilibrium position becomes bigger. We get a bigger component of gravity pulling it back. So, the restoring force that pulls it back to here, okay, the restoring force that pulls it back to its natural or equilibrium position gets bigger as the displacement gets bigger. Here's a certain force, here's a bigger force, here's an even bigger force because the displacement kept getting bigger. So a pendulum is a good example of simple harmonic motion. Another example of simple harmonic motion would be a spring. Anything where the restoring force is proportional to the displacement, that's sometimes hard to recognize. That's why we have that first definition, the one that's not really a definition, motion that repeats itself. It kind of helps us to recognize um, when we see an example of simple harmonic motion. We're going to define two terms. We've defined them before, but in another context. In the context of circular motion, frequency was the number of revolutions per second. In the context of simple harmonic motion, the frequency, given by the symbol lowercase f, is the number of cycles per unit time. 
number of back and forth cycles, the number of, uh, if we're talking about the pendulum, the number of times these keys go back and forth per unit time. What units would you use to measure frequency? It hertz, yes. HZ, that's cycles per second. Of course, we could see revolutions per minute or cycles per minute or something like that as well, but um, we want to be in hertz, HZ. And period, of course, big T is, of course, not the number of cycles per time, but it's the time per cycle. And the units for period would be seconds. This isn't new, right? It's just in a different context. We've done it in circular motion. We've done it now. We're doing it now in the context of repetitive motion, motion that repeats itself, back and forth motion. The equations are still the same. We can still find frequency by saying the number of cycles over time, although remember, that's not on our data sheet. We can find the period by saying the time over the number of cycles. Remember, that's not on the data sheet either. Or we can say the period is equal to 1 over the frequency, which, of course, is on our data sheet. Exactly the same as it was in the last unit. Okay, if you nailed that on the test yesterday for frequency period, okay, you're going to nail that in this unit as well because it's exactly the same. If you didn't nail it, then here it is in our second unit, so we've got to uh, pay a little bit more attention to that. All right, quick little example here. This is going to be lightning fast. Uh, notice it's chapter 7 now, if you're downloading the chapters of the textbook here. Page 345. It says, what is the frequency of an automobile engine in which the pistons oscillate with a period of 0 0.0625 seconds? What does oscillate mean? Like, like, mathematically, this is an easy question. Very easy question. Very straightforward. Sometimes we don't get past the words, though, right? Sometimes the words are hard to, you know, they kind of throw us for a loop because... We're not familiar with it. What does oscillate mean, Ben? Yep, back and forth. Oscillatory motion is just simple harmonic motion. Oscillating just means going back and forth. So we talk about the back and forth motion of the pendulum. The pendulum is oscillating. The back and forth motion of the spring, the spring is oscillating. The back and forth motion of the pistons in a car engine, you guys know how that works, right? There's gasoline vapor in, in the... Uh, in the cylinders of your car, the four, the six, the eight cylinders of your car, or if you're like me and drive a Lamborghini, the 12 cylinders of, of the car. Um, sorry, that might have been what I was dreaming of, not what I actually do. But when I win the lottery uh, next Saturday, <laughs> what I'll be driving. Anyways, the four, the six, the eight, the 12, the 10 cylinders, whatever, of, of the car, this gasoline burns and creates a pressure which pushes the piston up and down, up and down, up and down, back and forth, several thousand times per minute. We're saying here that the period of this, the time for one up and down motion of the piston, just one up and down motion of the piston is 0 0.06 seconds. That's the period. So we want to find the frequency. Easy, right? How do you find the frequency given the period? Yeah, f is equal to 1 over the period. We say t is equal to 1 over f, or f is equal to 1 over t. 1 over 0 0.0625. I'm going to show you a little trick. I've showed you this on the calculator before, but you can always go 1 over that, right? But you can also go 0 0.0625 and then hit what button? x to the minus 1 means 1 over that. So we can save ourselves the bother of you know, one or two keystrokes there. Here's a 16. That would be in hertz. When you look at the, it's called a tachometer on your car dash that gives you the, the frequency of the engine going back and forth. It'll talk about uh, thousands of revolutions per minute or thousands of cycles per minute as opposed to in hertz. Okay, this is the number of cycles per second on your car dash it'll tell you the number of cycles per minute. But it's the same thing. It's just a different set of units in measuring it. Have a look at these two questions, please. These are going to go lightning fast for you. It's 232. We're going to say at 235, we're going to move on. All right. Those are good. 
then let's look a little more specifically at a specific example of simple harmonic motion taking place, and that is springs. The spring, we know that, I told you a second, a few minutes ago, if you pull it and let it go, it's going to vibrate back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's motion that repeats itself. That's motion in which the restoring force, the force that pulls it back to its starting position, is related to how far it's stretched. In other words, the more you stretch it, the more the force, the force is, which causes the motion to repeat itself. So let's look closer at that. We say that a mass on the end of a spring, or an elastic for that matter, although it's a little bit easier to see it with an elastic, sorry, with a spring, because the vibration of the elastic dies out very quickly. But it happens in both. If we stretch it or compress it and we release it, not release to the point where it flies across the room, but release it to the point where it just vibrates back and forth in its own space, that's an example of simple harmonic motion. Why? Well, recall how we define simple harmonic motion there. We define it as motion that repeats itself. When we allow a spring to be released, the spring vibrates back and forth from a state of stretching to equilibrium to compression to equilibrium, then stretching, and so on. It vibrates back and forth. The motion repeats itself. That's the first way that we identified simple harmonic motion. The second way was motion in which the restoring force, the restoring force, we'll call that FR, is proportional to or related to the displacement. Now, this is a new certain term for you, a new symbol for you. X is going to be displacement for us. Not displacement delta D, as in how far it traveled, but displacement x as in how far it stretched. The force is related to how much it stretched or compressed. Now, as a result of this relationship between f and x, we get an equation that describes the restoring force in harmonic motion that looks like this. We're going to say fr if it's related to x, the displacement, then it's equal to a constant times x. So we're going to identify this, fr, as our restoring force. And that's going to be measured in newtons. That's the force that pulls it back to where it started. x is the displacement. But remember what displacement we're talking about here. We're not talking about how far it travels from Okotoks to Calgary, but we're, we're, we're talking about the amount stretched or compressed. What do I mean by compressed? What's another word for compressed? What's a simpler word for compressed? Squished? The amount stretched or squished? And k, k is just a constant. We call it a spring constant or an elastic constant if we're using an elastic rather than a spring. The units for that are newtons per meter. And that number is different for each spring. The stiffer the spring, the higher the spring constant. So if you take a, a spring that's really, really hard to, to, to squish or to, to stretch, that's going to have a higher spring constant than maybe the spring on the inside of a pen, which you know because you've taken apart pens before, right? Is really, really weak, really flimsy, right? And it, it's really easy to compress or stretch, so the spring constant for that would be very small. Yep. Yes, that says restoring force, not restoving force. Let me. That doesn't look any better. But that's what it says, as it's supposed to say, restoring, not restoving. Yep. Newtons per meter. Yeah, sorry, newtons per meter. I swear, if I write by hand, it's easier to read it. It's hard to write on a smart board, actually, neatly. It really is, yeah. Could you say that K is the the elasticity, be careful with that. Um, I think 
In terms of the way you're thinking about it, that's probably a fairly safe thing to do, but that's not what it is. That's not what it's called. Um, so I would, I would hesitate to, to even think of it like that because you don't want to end up getting it confused down the road with something else. But I think in the way that you're thinking of that word, yes. So, why does simple harmonic motion repeat itself? That's really how we identify it, right? Motion that repeats itself. Why does it repeat itself? Well, because as I stretch something, the force becomes bigger. And when I let it go, the force pulls it back to its equilibrium. It goes through the equilibrium, and then the restoring force becomes bigger. It slows down and stops, pulls it back, goes through, slows down and stop, pulls it back, speeds up, slows down, stops, and so on. Why does it repeat itself? Because the restoring force gets bigger as the displacement gets bigger. Okay? It's hard to see that. Right? It's easy to see motion that repeats itself. But that's why the motion repeats itself, because f is, is related to x, or f is equal to k times x. Okay, does that make a little bit of sense? Okay, let's take a look at an example with that then, with this Hooke's Law thing. By the way, I forgot to even mention that. The title of it said Springs and Hooke's Law. This is called Hooke's Law. So that relationship is just named after Hooke's Law. I think Hooke actually found that relationship. That's pretty fundamental to simple harmonic motion, right? Motion which the restoring force is proportional to the displacement, which leads us to this equation. So that's, that's this equation, Hooke's Law, is essentially the definition of simple harmonic motion. Okay, example 7.3. This one says a spring has a spring constant of 30 newtons per meter. The spring is pulled to a distance of 1.5 meters from the equilibrium position. What is the restoring force? So we're not saying that, that we're pulling the spring 1.5 meters across the room. We're not saying that we let the spring go and it flies 1.5 meters up into the air. We're saying that it simply stretched 1.5 meters. How hard does the spring pull back? Well, we're going to say K is 30.0 newtons per meter. We're going to say x is 1.5 meters, not delta d. Remember, delta d displacement is how far it moved. x displacement is how far it stretched. We want to find the restoring force. By the way, guys, should have said, you know, you know what, I'll take that off and I'll explain that later. Yeah, Rachel Crusher? That is a lowercase k. Okay, so capital K would be, um, in most contexts, would be uh, Kepler's constant. Okay, completely different thing. This is a lowercase k, completely different thing. I, I kind of lied a little bit here, guys. I'm going to get you to add something here. The restoring force, we usually tack on a little negative there. And let me explain why, as we do this example, why it's negative. The restoring force being negative kx tells us that if the displacement is one way, the spring pulls back the opposite way, right? If I stretch the spring to the right, which way does the spring pull back? To the, to the left, right? If I, pu if I pull it to the right, the spring pulls back to the left. If I pull it to the left, the spring pulls back to the right. So the restoring force is technically negative kx, but if you leave that off, we're not going to lose any sleep over that, okay? You make it positive, you make it negative, you can still, you'll still get full marks for it. Yep. How does both sides of the spring are pulling? Uh, that's okay. Both sides of the, the uh, spring is pulling, then we just say the displacement is, um, we just say the displacement is the total displacement as measured from the equilibrium position, okay? Um, now, so we're looking for uh, F here, uh, negative 30.0 newtons per meter times the displacement of 1.5. That's going to give us a restoring force of negative 45.0 newtons. Again, you leave off the negative. I'm not going to take off marks for that, all right? Now, understand what that means, though. Like, I pull on it to stretch it. 
it pulls back with negative 45. If I was actually looking for how hard I pulled, the applied force, as opposed to how hard it's pulling back, what would the answer be, technically? 45. If I pull with 45 positive, then the spring pulls back, the restoring force would be negative 45. If object A applies a force on B, object B applies an equal and opposite force on object A. So technically, the force that pulls back is negative. The force that I pull with, the applied force, is, is, is positive. But because they're the same magnitude, uh, we're not going to worry too much about the negatives then. All right, try these two questions, please. All right, here's another one that's a little bit harder if you're comfortable with those last two questions here. This one says, a spring is hung from a hook on a ceiling when a mass of 0.5, sorry, 510.0 grams is attached to the spring. The spring stretches the distance of 0.5 meters. What's the spring constant here? Hmm. Okay, so we want to find the spring constant. We're going to say F is equal to KX. Hey, does anybody know why I dropped the negative on that one? Like, if you get a little bit confused on that, then I want you just to not worry too much about it. But technically, the last question we did should have a negative, and technically this one should not. The reason is because in this one, we're not actually talking about the force that pulls it back. We're talking about the force that pulled it out. The, the applied force. What did you say, Josh? Yeah. Yeah, so, so there is a force that pulls it down. That's the applied force. That pulls it back up is the restoring force. Okay, and when we use the restoring force equation, it's negative kx. When we use the applied force, it's just well, the opposite to the restoring force, so it's positive, right? So we're going to use f is equal to kx. But like I said, guys, if you... If that confuses you at all, just drop the negative. It's not the end of the world. So let's solve for, let's solve for k here. Rearrange this. f over x. f over x is k. OK, good, good. Uh, oh, wait a second. What's the force? What is the force here? Remember I said this one's a little bit harder. Danny, is your hand up? Yes, that's exactly what you do. What force provides the applied force? What force pulls this spring out? The spring pulls back, right? But something has to pull it out. What force pulls it out? It's gravity. It's m times g. So we're going to say it's 0 0.510 kilograms times 9.81. We're not going to worry about the negative there because we're just dealing with the magnitude here. Divided by x, the amount that it's stretched, 0 0.500 meters. Let's figure this one out together now. Let's say 0 0.510 times 9.81 divided by 0.5 gives me a value of 10.00. We're going to round it to three digits, 10.0, and the units would be newtons per meter. If you've messed up with the negatives, you might end up getting a negative value for spring constant. That's the one thing that I don't want to see. If you get a negative value for spring constant, what should you do with it? Make it positive. Just make it positive. Because spring constant will always be a positive value. Two more questions that I'd like you to do. These ones are similar to the example questions with vertical springs. Remember, dealing with a vertical spring, F is equal to Kx, always. But when you're dealing with a vertical spring, F will also be equal to M times G. So remember to combine those two only for a vertical spring, not for something that's horizontal. I should say. All right, number one says five people with a combined mass of 275 kilograms get into a car. The car's four springs are each compressed a distance of five centimeters. Um, what's the spring constant of the springs? And the mass is evenly distributed to the springs. So um, you guys know that a car has four springs, right? Okay, each, uh, around each wheel okay, that takes the weight of the car and allows the car to go on bumps and not have such a bumpy ride as it goes over railroad tracks and potholes in the road and, and so on. Um, if, if the mass is distributed evenly for the four springs, it's like saying we have a mass for each spring of 275 kilograms divided by four, which gives me what? See that? 275 
divide it by four gives me a value of 68.75 kilograms. So as much as there is a mass of 275, each spring has to hold 68.75 kilograms. Does that make sense? Now we're going to say F is equal to kx, or k is equal to F over x. But we're talking about vertical springs in a car, right? So the force would be the mass times gravity, 68.75 times 9.81. Divide that by the displacement of each spring, which is 0 0.050 meters. And when we do that, we should get the answer that's in the book there, 1.35 times 10 to the 4 newtons per meter. Now, there was a couple people that did it slightly different, but just variations on the same method. Jacob, I think you said, you said the force was 275 times 9.81 divided by 0 0.05 and got a spring constant that was not that value, and then you divided that spring constant by 4. Okay. Um, Mackenzie uh, did a little bit differently still. She pretended there was 4 times the distance stretching because it was 4 springs that were each stretched 0 0.05 meters, right? So she said there was a 20 meter stretching with 275 kilograms. Gives us the same answer, right? Okay, it doesn't really matter as long as you um, somewhere okay, um, recognize that you've got information about four springs and you need to turn it into one spring. Okay, whether you kind of do it in one place or another, it works. Okay, give you another minute to finish number two and then we'll take a look at that one. Let's take a look at number two now. This one's even harder. This one's two springs. This one says two springs are hooked together, and one end is attached to a ceiling. Spring A has a spring constant of 25 newtons per meter. B is 60 newtons per meter, and there's a 40 newton. 40 newton, by the way, is weight, the force of gravity acting on it. Saves me a little bit of bother because I don't need to multiply m times g here. Pulling it downward from the ceiling, what's the total displacement? So this is what we got here. Here's the ceiling. Here's spring A. Spring A. And spring A has a spring constant of 25 newtons per meter. Um, and we have, then we have another one hooked to it, which is spring B. And it has a spring constant of 60 newtons per meter. We're going to put a mass on the end of it. And that mass, I don't know what the mass is, but I know the weight of it, the force of gravity acting on it, is 40.0 newtons. Now, you've got to understand here that if 40 newtons is pulling on the system, 40 newtons is pulling on each spring, right? So we're going to say that the displacement, if we look at F is equal to kx, the displacement for the first one is F over k. That's going to be, what, uh, 40 newtons divided by 25 newtons per meter. What does that give me? 40 divided by 25. 1.6. Okay. 1.6 meters. And for the second one, we're going to say x is equal to f over k. The force on this one is also 40 newtons, and the spring constant is 60 newtons per meter. We do the math on that one, and it works out to be 0 0.667 meters. Now, how are we going to find the total displacement here? Franny, how are we going to find the total displacement there? Yeah, we add them together. Good. So we're going to say... Uh, the displacement, total displacement is 1.6 meters plus 0 0.667 meters, which gives me two, two digits, 2.3 meters. Now, I don't like the fact that they put a negative in there. That's not because of a negative kx thing. Like, this is applied force. They're saying that negative is because it's a downward force. Um, like, if you were confused about the negatives with the kx, the negative kx, this just makes it even worse. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that negative at all. Okay, if you said it was negative, that's great because it's downward. But if you said it was positive because you took the magnitude of it, I am absolutely fine with that. You put that on a quiz or a test, you still get 100 on that. All right? Finally, today, I want to talk about the energy of a spring. We talked a little bit about the energy of a spring back in Unit 2, our dynamics unit, when we talked about kinetic and potential energy. There is energy stored in a spring or an elastic that's stretched or compressed. We call that spring or elastic potential energy. You can imagine the more the spring is compressed or stretched, the more energy it stores, right? When I pull that elastic back just a little bit and allow it to fly across the room, I pull it back 
even more, it flies across the room even faster because the more I stretched it, the more potential energy that it stored. We know that EP due to gravity is MGH. EK is 1 half MV squared. EP, potential energy due to a spring or an elastic, is equal to 1 half KX squared. What's K stand for? You better know this. Yeah, it's a spring constant. And the units would be newtons per meter. X would stand for the displacement. But remember, not the displacement across the room, but rather the displacement, how much it's stretched or compressed in meters. Same as it was before in our Hooke's Law equation. Uh, EP would stand for the spring or elastic potential energy. Now, sometimes you're given a question where you have K and you have X in meters. So many numbers solve for EP. Easy. Sometimes you don't know the value of K. So sometimes what you got to do when solving for EP, potential energy, is take that equation and this equation to solve for K. Does that make sense? So we now have two equations that are applicable, Hooke's Law and the spring potential energy equation, whenever we have a spring or an elastic. Sometimes you'll use F is equal to KX to find K and then sub that number into the potential energy equation. Sometimes you'll use the potential energy equation to find K and then sub it into the other one to find the force. Two equations, sometimes you need one of them, sometimes you need both of them. You just got to look at what you got and, and what you're looking for. Okay, if one of them doesn't work, try the other one. If the other one doesn't work, try using both of them and eventually you've got to get an answer. One example, last one of the day. Notice this one's chapter 6, though. It's kind of odd that they go from chapter 7 with Hooke's Law back to chapter 6 with this stuff, but it is what it is here. Um, example 6.4, page 301, says a spring is stretched to a position 35 centimeters from its equilibrium or natural position. At that point, the force is 10.5 newtons. We want to find the elastic potential energy stored in the spring. And uh, if we reduce this, the uh, stretching to 20 centimeters, what's the change in elastic potential energy? Let's do A first. What is the elastic potential energy here? Uh, we don't know what K is, do we? Idea? What should we do? Yeah, K is equal to F over X. So we're going to say here the force is 10.5 newtons, and we're going to say the displacement is 0.35 meters. I believe that gives me 30 newtons per meter. So now we're going to say EP is equal to 1 half of 30 times X, which is 0 0.35 squared. Let's do that on the calculator here. 0 0.5 times 30 times 0.35 squared gives me a value of 1.8375. We're going to round that to, should be three digits, 1.84 joules. Okay, good. First one, done. Second one now. Now, pay really close attention to this one because there's a mistake that we can make on this one easily. We stretch the spring now 20 centimeters. What's the potential energy? We want to find the change in potential energy, but really we want to find the potential energy, then subtract, right? What's the potential energy now? Oh, do we got to do this again? Why not? Good. You guys nailed that. Good. It's the same spring. We don't need to say, oh, X is different. You know what? So would F be different. We can't just say 10.5 over 0.2 because... Remember, the force is proportional to the displacement. If x is different, f is different. I don't know what the force is here, but it doesn't matter because I already know what k is. As long as it's the same spring, we can use the same value of k. 30 newtons per meter. x is now 0 0.20. Let's figure out what that is. Don't forget to square that. I'm going to say 0 0.5 times 30 times 0.2 squared gives me a value of 0 0.60. Okay, is that my answer? No, but I'm pretty close, right? What's my answer? Yeah, it's actually um, 
Technically, it would be final minus initial, 0 0.60 minus 1.84, which is negative 1.24, right? Um, what, is, what does a negative mean there? Not a direction, but what does it mean there? It's lost, right? The energy is lost. Good. Okay? How do you feel about that? Okay, good. You have a little bit of homework tonight? Take a look at those questions, please, tonight.